Hello and <clears throat> excuse me. Welcome to our second lecture in Module Seven. Uh, we talked last time about semantic memory. We're going to take uh, the next step further and talk a little bit about what we call concepts and categories. We introduced the idea of a concept in the previous lecture uh, when I talked about um, essentially what we mean by a concept. Um, what we're going to talk today is about how those concepts develop and how we develop uh, categories and different types of categories. So we'll start by talking about different types of categories. Um, we categorize things in our world in a variety of different ways, and the first of these are what we call natural categories. These occur naturally in the world, and they essentially define themselves. Flowers, fruits, vegetables, plants, animals, dogs, cats, um, and essentially they're naturally occurring concepts that are, are labeled after discovery. And of course, we sometimes quibble about what belongs in what category. Is tomato a fruit? Is tomato a vegetable? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but they're you know, essentially defining themselves. Not really all that difficult to get our heads around. Dogs are one type of, um, sort of natural category. Now, artifact categories are objects or conventions designed by us to serve particular functions. Furniture, tables, chairs. Uh, and category membership then is primarily determined by their function or their intended use. Tools, cars, trucks, SUVs, um, that sort of thing. So we think about these types of categories as categories that are essentially created by us because they serve a particular purpose. Now, I want to go back to uh, this idea in that we actually have created artifact categories in living beings because we've created herding dogs. We've bred them for a particular purpose. And so we put um, Pembroke Welsh Corgis, um, Shetland Sheepdogs, and Australian Shepherds and Border Collies all into uh, the herding uh, category because they're designed uh, to herd animals for us, cattle, sheep, that sort of thing. So the idea is we have to think about um, one thing might be categorized a variety of different ways depending on how we're looking at it. Nominal categories are just linguistic conventions that involve really arbitrary assignments of a label to things that fit a particular set of conditions and these are often defined as a matter of convenience. Tall people, short people. Um, <laughs> gender is its very nature a nominal category. And in fact, uh, one of the things uh, that we are learning more as we learn more and more about gender is it really isn't the nominal category we always thought it was. It's actually really a spectrum. Um, and so the idea of binary gender is something that a lot of people are rejecting um, because not everyone is just male or female. And in fact, the biology underpins this as well. And you can view some of my lectures on <coughs> um, sex and sexual differentiation in my physiology course. Um, but the idea behind nominal category is it's just a linguistic convention. Um, us, them, this, that, you know, they're really relatively straightforward. Um, oftentimes things like uh, race, ethnicity are really nominal categories. They don't have any meaning behind them. They're just things that we um, use to check a box. Ad hoc categories are formed just for a particular purpose or can be influenced by context. Um, so those of you who are fans of the $100,000 pyramid, um, this is where we get the kind of ad hoc categories on this kind of show. Things um, you might take on vacation, uh, things in the kitchen. Um, this would be an example of an ad hoc category of things that are round. Um, there's actually a set of ad hoc category norms uh, that I've used in uh, some experiments. So. This is one of them. And feet, dust, bird, atom, hands, animal, cell, and children are theoretically things that are small or small things. But again, ad hoc categories can be formed for a particular purpose. Things I take on vacation, things you take camping, um, things I pack to take to the gym, things I eat for lunch. Um, these are really uh, any number of kinds of, of combinations of things. One of the things uh, we talk a lot about are different levels of categorization. We talk about 
subordinate versus superordinate categories. So categories are both horizontally and vertically organized. So the horizontal organization distinguish one category from the other. Animals versus plants, right? Is a horizontal organization. Then the vertical organization, a subcategory of animals is birds, a subcategory of birds is raptors. And so this is where we get into superordinate and subordinate categories. So animal is superordinate to bird, bird is subordinate to animal. Raptor is subordinate to bird, bird is superordinate to raptor. So it looks something like this. So animals is the superordinate category, birds and cats are subordinate categories, subordinate categories of uh, birds as raptors and songbirds, a subcategory of raptors as eagles, um, and so, so on and so forth. And so you can see this kind of hierarchical nature of uh, categories. The next question is how are categories represented and how are they created um, in terms of concepts and their um, representation to categories? So the classic approaches are similar to the feature theories we talked about in the last lecture. Where cl classification is based on certain features or characteristics. That's a dog because it has four legs, fuzzy ears, tail, um, with features that are both necessary and sufficient for categorization. Unfortunately, not everything can be categorized this way, and there's obviously things that don't fit the category directly. So things like games. Uh, for example, are very difficult to define what a game is. Uh, there are also, of course, problems with typicality effects. What is a typical dog versus what's a typical cat? What's a typical bird? And there are fuzzy boundaries between categories. So is a fox a dog? Is it a canine? Is it a coyote? Um, where do we draw the line? And so we have to think about those kinds of issues. Uh, there are two different theories about, uh, additional theories about how we develop categories, and one of these is what we call a prototype theory. As we learn, we abstract out a prototype of a concept or a category. So a prototype is the most typical or representative idea of a category, and the important thing to realize is that this isn't a thing that exists. Um, it is a, an abstraction of what best represents whatever it is that we're, we think of as uh, a category. So, for example, you might not know any police officers, but you have the idea of what a prototypical police officer is like or looks like. And this may be based on your biases, it may be based on information you know uh, or have learned, uh, all sorts of different ways that you might think about how you might have some idea of what a prototypical firefighter or, sorry, police officer is like. Um, exemplar theories uh, is where category membership is conducted by comparison to stored examples or exemplars. So uh, examples that you're familiar with and aware of you compare to. So if we're talking about say dogs, rather than thinking about what a prototypical dog is, you think about all the dogs that you know and does this fit in with what I know about dogs. More typical members will be similar to many exemplars. Uh, and category, categorization is entirely based on comparison to stored examples. So I compare this to the thing, the dogs that I've met and known over my life, and does it feel like a dog to me? Yes. Um, so we're basing it on stored examples. So keep in mind that that means we're talking about two different memory formation strategies. So comparison to specific memories of category examples versus this abstracted prototype. Um, that isn't based entirely on a specific memory, but on a generalization across memory. So one of the things uh, that the way we form uh, our view towards concepts and categories is that they can have uh, some specific applications, in particular stereotyping. We automatically categorize people based on visual features. Um, we categorize them based on what we think their sex is, their age might be, their race might be, their weight is, and we oftentimes make judgments about people. And sometimes these are automatic um, without us even realizing that we have made these kinds of judgments. Social category level beliefs have the power to shape our impressions of individuals. So if we have had some sort of experience or have been raised to believe certain things about groups of people, 
that's going to shape our impressions of individuals. So we may believe that certain people are less trustworthy, that they're more likely to be armed. So this is an, an important social uh, phenomenon that we really have to understand and uh, sort of take a hold of and start uh, thinking about how we develop beliefs which are basically how we have assigned somebody a category and what we think is associated with that category. So some of these are automatic, others are based on either acquired information or assumptions about category membership even without um, really any evidence to support any of these beliefs. So this is related to a field of what we call unconscious bias. And this is an area where we uh, are seeing a great deal of interest in research. So for example, um, there is some unconscious bias in believing that um, African American um, male suspects uh, that police deal with are more likely to be armed, when in fact they're less likely to be armed uh, than a white suspect. And so we have to think about how that assumption about their level in uh, their membership in a group has become associated with a certain level of information that is actually inaccurate. Um, same thing with um, finding out that someone's gay. You might have automatic beliefs about them um, because of the information that you have or you believe you have about what a stereotypical gay man might look like. So that gets us into perceptions of minorities. So we've seen a great deal of this uh, lately with people calling the police on um, ethnic minorities doing nothing other than trying to live their lives, um, having barbecues or um, sitting at Starbucks, and the perception is that they must be doing something wrong. And that is based on this idea of that they are part of some category that we, some people have beliefs about. And so we have to understand this important social process if we're going to fight this kind of unjustified um, really relatively ridiculous use of categories where it categorized people as being dangerous because they're part of a minority. And that's certainly something we have to figure out how to fix. Um, on a related note, we also perceive sexual minorities in uh, specific ways. So in a research study um, that I conducted, uh, we found that the exact same person in the exact same performance was perceived as less masculine simply because he was categorized as gay. And so by attaching that category label to him, um, that the beliefs about what a gay man is um, were activated. And so the, we'll talk about schemas here in a moment, but the scheme of what a gay man is means that they must be less masculine, which is absolutely not the truth. Um, but that concept of what a gay man is Perceive, cause people to perceive this individual to be less masculine, whereas people who were told that he was straight did not perceive him as being less masculine. In fact, it was the exact same person. It was just the category label attached to that. Um, so our knowledge may influence our behavior in these cases, but also our um, lack of knowledge or our um, perceptions or biases may influence our behavior. And so it's something we have to keep in mind. Part of this idea is what we call stereotype threat, and this is more um, people who are part of a, a social category. So stereotype threat is the self-threat experienced by members of a negatively stereotyped group that they will be judged or behave in ways that confirm the stereotype. And what happens is this often precipitates the undesired behavior because of stereotype threat, they actually fulfill the stereotype. Um, so our knowledge of our own group membership can actually influence our own behavior. So this is another thing we have to be mindful of uh, in both judging people who are part of groups and also um, how we behave as part of our own um, group. So how might categories affect behavior? Well, social categories might be formed via prototypes or exemplars. And we see oftentimes that prototypes are the most biased, whereas people who have specific exemplars are less biased because they have friends, colleagues that they know who are gay or who are part of an ethnic minority. Um, so as we start thinking about how social categories are formed, think about things like gender, uh, what does it mean to be masculine or feminine, um, how do these social categories versus prototypes, for example, ours relate to sexual orientation. Um, and interestingly, we see um, the sort of social reinforcement of sort of gender norms and occupations via both prototypes and exemplars or lack of exemplars. 
So for example, um, one of the most gendered occupations in the United States is dental hygienist. 99% of dental hygienists are female. Now, is it because we stereotype a dental hygienist as female, or is it because there are very few exemplars of male dental hygienists? So as we start seeing more um, exemplars of people in occupations that uh, we may have not thought of before, so uh, obviously women are dominating the medical field, um, women are fighter pilots, um, we see men doing what were stereotypically women jobs, being nurses, um, when we start seeing more of those examples, we'll start to alter our view of these categories. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So finally, some other ways that knowledge influences our behaviors is through schemas and scripts. We've talked a little bit about this already, but schemas and scripts, of course, guide our actions. Um, I've been interested lately in how our early knowledge uh, about um, cultures and other places develop a schema about how we view those places and those people. And so, for example, a lot of us, our early um, childhood, we read things like Heart of Darkness. And so it develops uh, this biased view of what we think the African continent is like, uh, which is completely inaccurate. It was inaccurate then, and it's certainly inaccurate now. But it develops, we develop a schema about it. And I think it's really important for us to start thinking about how these schemas and scripts guide our actions and how they develop and how we can maybe develop new schemas. They certainly can lead us into trouble. Um, we've seen this a lot lately um, with things like sexual schemas and scripts and that people have this belief about how something is supposed to go and how it's going to go and then somebody says no but they are still in their sexual schema or their script. Um, certainly there are evolving standards of how people behave. And we see this in the Me Too movement in what was once uh, unfortunately acceptable, particularly in Hollywood, um, sexual harassment was just simply rampant, um, is no longer acceptable, but it's getting a lot of people into trouble because they have a schema about how these things are supposed to work. Finally, um, our knowledge and belief can both alter our perception and our memory. So we'll talk about uh, the development of um, illusory correlations when we get to talking about decision making in the next module. Um, but as we start to have beliefs about the world, we perceive the world in ways that are consistent with those beliefs and we retrieve memories in ways that are consistent with those beliefs. And so we really have to be conscious of the fact that our social c categories and the ways in which maybe we have been raised or um, the way in which the media has influenced us uh, has led us to having uh, sort of reinforcing our own biases. And this is all related to these cognitive schemas and also our categories and our concepts about categories. So keep that in mind uh, and be mindful of how your own cognitive processes may be affecting your biases. All right, next time we'll pick up and talk about language.